Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad that you're all able to uh, join us for this is actually our second of uh, a new series that we're introducing this month. And for those that may not know me, my name is Wisteria Perry. I'm the manager of interpretation and community outreach, uh, and I work in the Department of Interpretation. Um, as I mentioned, this is the second of three series that we're introducing this year. Um, our, the second one is called African Kingdoms and Maritime Cultures. I think a lot of people may not realize that there are a number of kingdoms and cultures throughout um, African history that has been touched by, uh, by water, whether it's a lake, a river, or an ocean. And so, as I mentioned, this is going to be an ongoing uh, series that we're going to be doing throughout the year. And we're going to be starting with ancient Carthage. And so I'd like to introduce uh, my teammate, uh, Erica Cosme, who is the content interpretation developer and also a member of the Department of Interpretation. So looking forward uh, to this new um, series. I hope that you're all as excited as we are as well. All right, Erica, over to you. All right, thank you. And just to reiterate, we are really excited about expanding what a lot of the topics that we are doing for Black History Month and carrying them throughout uh, more of the year, just so that not only we can get more stories out, but as we uncover more within our collection here at the Mariners Museum and Park, it's just a great way to really utilize all of that information and not just condense it down into the 28 or 29 days uh, that is the month of February. But uh, for today, we are going to start uh, this series, Africa's Kingdoms and Maritime Cultures, with an ancient uh, maritime culture that was Carthage. Now, before we get further into that, we are still in Black History Month. And when we say Africa's maritime cultures and kingdoms, you know, we wanted to expand it outside of just African American or Black history, but to include the actual continent of Africa. So, just a, key, a few key stats and figures here. Um, there are seven continents on our planet. Africa is the second largest and has the second largest population, both of, second, uh, both of which are second to Asia. Um, and Africa also has 48 mainland countries and six island nations for a complete total of 54 countries that make up the continent and the region that we're gonna be talking about, not just today, but as like we said, we expand this series. Specifically, we are going to be looking at an area that in present day is called Tunisia, uh, the capital of which is Tunis. It's located in the North Africa region, right along the Mediterranean Sea. So it's got some beautiful, vibrant, um, lush resources and everything there. And as you can, let me go back to this slide, just to show you, I love this topographical look of how Africa is shown here you really get the diversity and fertility of how the land looks. You've got all that lush green region mixed with the arid uh, desert regions that are kind of that brown and tan color. And then again, located right off the Mediterranean Sea, it's got some just gorgeous areas um, that make up what we refer to as North Africa. So again, just a couple quick stats and figures. Tunisia, the capital of which is Tunis, it's got a land size of approximately a little over 63,000 square miles. Just for reference, that is slightly larger than the US state of Georgia. So not the biggest of the North African countries, but pretty big still in its size. And as of this morning, uh, the population was listed at almost 12 million, uh, or I should say a little over 11 million um, people who make up the country. Um, so it's got, as I said, a really rich, long-standing culture and history. And that's kind of the, the, the area and the region that we're gonna be looking at today, but reflecting on the ancient city of Carthage. 
And I love incorporating items from our collection anytime I get. So here is an early 19th century map of North Africa. Again, you can kind of see the region that we'll be looking at. Tunisia is uh, sandwiched between modern day Algeria and Libya. So one of the things I really loved about this map, other than the fact that I just love maps from our collection, is that if you kind of look at different areas, they've got small um, depictions of various cities and such throughout, including Tunis and Tunisia that we'll be looking at. And if you look on the, the image on the right here, you can see in the background very lightly some of the, the ships and boats in the background there that again, just reflect the fact that this was a maritime culture here. Now, a lot of people don't necessarily think of Africa as having a big maritime history. So I think one of the really good things about this series and the next series with Steria and I will be doing uh, helps highlight some more of those cultures, both past and present. So this is a map of the Mediterranean region. I've highlighted some of the areas that we'll be mentioning today and kind of be looking at. Um, Carthage is pointed out down here for you on the tip of, again, what is present day Tunisia, along with some of the cultures that were also um, thriving during this period here. Now, before we get into Carthage, we kind of have to set it up and discuss a culture that was known as the Phoenicians. So Phoenicia and its most prominent city-state of Tyre were located on the eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea here. It's where uh, present-day Lebanon and northern Israel are currently situated. So I've highlighted that and they were one of the earliest maritime cultures that really kind of set a precedence for a lot of the trade that was and would be happening throughout the Mediterranean as more people were going out farther throughout the seas and eventually what would become the oceans. Um, so they were merchants, traders and colonizers and they predominantly reigned throughout the first millennium. So that's about 1000 BCE before the common era to about one BCE. And as I mentioned, Tyre was probably its most prominent city state. It was a port town located right on the coast. Uh, here's another great image on the left here from our collection. Again, just kind of showing cityscapes that overlook the waterways, just reiterating the fact that this was a maritime culture and that they relied heavily on these bodies of water that surrounded it. And eventually they would expand further out into different regions. And the Phoenicians were essentially the earliest descendants of what would become the Carthaginian people. So we have an image here of a queen whose name was Dido. Um, if you look her up, she also is referred to as Alyssa, spelled E-L-I-S-S-A, which I think is just a really pretty spelling. Um, so Dido in legend, in myth and legend and lore is kind of dedicated as the founder of what became Carthage. Now, the region that would become Carthage was already inhabited by African people, Berbers, um, nomadic groups, Islamic groups, or what would become Islamic groups. So the area in the region that we refer to as Carthage wasn't necessarily just an empty land with no uh, people already living there but Dido and eventually the Phoenicians who followed her from that point on kind of created the city, the greatness as we remember it of Carthage. Now, the historicity of Dido and the accuracy of her actually founding the city is kind of disputed among scholars and historians. However, most people do agree that the date of 814 BCE is about the time that the city of Carthage was, was founded. So how did a Phoenician queen all the way on one side of the Mediterranean wind up in the city of Carthage? There's a great 
uh, epic poem kind of similar to the Iliad written by Homer that is called the Aeneid. It's written by a Latin poet named Virgil. Um, it tells the story of post-Troy, the city of Troy that was defeated by the Greeks, and what happened to the Trojans that were left and after they fled the city of Troy. Now, in the story, Aeneid of Aeneas eventually meets the queen Dido, and she tells how when she was living in Tyre, over in the land of the Phoenicians, her brother, who was there when their father had passed, he had split the power between his son and his daughter Dido. Now, eventually, Pygmalion, her brother, wanted all of the power, wound up killing Dido's husband, and fearing for her life, believing that he was coming after her as well, wound up fleeing and sailing across the Mediterranean and landing uh, on this coastal city with a natural harbor. And the inhabitants there, she asked if she could have any of the land or some of the land for you know some of the people that came with her. And they told her she could have as much land as an ox hide would cover. So she being very clever, cut the ox hide into these very, very thin strips so that she could spread them out as far as possible and wound up being able to cover a, a good chunk of land or a hill that had a natural harbor to it. And that land was given to her. And from that point on, it really kind of grew into the, the city, a new city state that became known as Carthage. Um, Carthage in Phoenician means new city. So it became kind of the new settlement for where Phoenicians would start to come. Now, Phoenicians would really start to populate the land around 3, 330, 332 um, BCE when Alexander the Great's army came in and really just took over and dominated and occupied much of the territory over in that area. So the Phoenicians who left Tyre and specifically knowing of the port of Carthage moved to that region. Enough of them were able to escape with a good chunk of their, their goods and their money and were able to establish Carthage as a more prominent port and a more prominent city. And from that point on, it grew from there. And I'm a huge fan. I love Greek and, and Roman and uh, classical literature. And the Aeneid is one of my favorite books slash epic poems. And I'm just going to read this short passage here from book one of the Aeneid that kind of shows and sets a precedence for Dido coming over to this area. And it reads here, an ancient town was seated on the sea, a Tyrian colony. The people made stout for the war and studious of their trade. Carthage, the name. The rising city, which from far you see is Carthage and a Tyrian colony. Phoenician Dido rules the growing state who fled from Tyre to shun her brother's hate. So again, kind of just giving that brief background and, and there's more to the background of that in the story here. I just wanted this small excerpt, just kind of showing that a lot of this uh, mythology or legend of when, when and where Carthage came to be is really left to us in this book. So as I mentioned, Aeneas was a son of Troy. He fled after the Trojan War. He kind of bounced around throughout the Mediterranean Sea, winding up at one point in Carthage where he and the queen Dido wind up falling in love. However, Aeneas is told he has this great destiny. So he's not able to stay in Carthage, although he does stall his trip for several years in order to be with Dido as long as possible. Eventually, Aeneas winds up in this land that will later on become Rome. Now, this is hundreds of years before what we will know as the Roman Empire, um, but it's worth mentioning and pointing out because as we look further, as we get further and look into this program a little more, we are going to see the uh, love-hate, mostly hate relationship that Carthage and Rome are gonna have. So it's really funny just that this story 
maybe unknowingly or maybe intentionally sets the stage for what's going to become this rivalry of sorts between these two great areas. So the Carthaginians, unlike a lot of other great empires, weren't necessarily in it for the conquest of other lands and enslaving other people, although that did happen quite frequently within their reign as an empire. Uh, but Carthage was in it more for the, the monetary value and the occupation of the trade routes throughout the Mediterranean Sea. That's really where their focus was and what you know they considered to be their prize. So a lot of the regions that they took over are gonna be mostly coastal areas. Um, and if you look on this map, I've highlighted some of the more prominent areas along North Africa here, over into the Iberian Peninsula where present day Spain and Portugal are located. But it's also worth pointing out some of these little island nations that are on this map, because we know today that most of these are part of Italy's control. They're part of the Italian territory, especially Sicily, right down here, most of which was controlled by Carthage at one point in time. Again, this is setting a stage and a precedence for some of the conflicts that we're gonna see between Carthage and Rome down the road. So this occupation of certain lands and territories is really gonna kind of start a, a butting of heads and a, 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 a control issues and dominance for all of these areas in the region. So again, Carthage was really exceptionally favored by its position, uh, located right here on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. The port of Carthage and the harbor and everything had a natural barrier to it, which was great for ships that were coming in. This natural harbor pre uh, prevented a lot of storms from coming too far inland, which was great shelter for a lot of the ships that were traveling throughout this area here, back and forth across the Mediterranean, along North Africa, and just throughout this, this region. So as mentioned, the Phoenicians in particular, and later on the uh, land of Carthage, would become really this stronghold and epicenter for trade throughout the Mediterranean. That's really where, again, their focus for power and dominance was. It was focusing more on the commerce versus just the control and occupation of lands. Again, that does not mean they never went into territories and went and unfortunately enslaved people and took over a lot of those areas, but it, it was kind of done a little differently than a lot of other empires that you think of later on, the Mongols, and as I've mentioned, the Romans. So conquest wasn't their initial plan or desire. It was the control for the trade routes throughout the, the Mediterranean. I really just want to emphasize that. So with trade, what are some of the items that they were trading? Well, lots of things. And, and these are two coins on the right-hand side from our collection, just uh, showing it's from that region and that time period discussing uh, Phoenician trade. Everything was being traded throughout this time. You had lumber for ships. You had precious gems and minerals such as gold, silver, and other items. Pottery, items like glass. And food sources as well. Cattle, meat, fish grains, wheat, rice, wines, and oils, all of these items were being traded throughout this region. And again, Carthage had a major foothold. So a lot of people were coming through this port, which basically means more money for the city of Carthage. But perhaps the Phoenicians claim to fame and by extension, Carthage's claim to fame came from Tyrian dye. So throughout Tyre that I mentioned earlier, um, along the beaches would be something called the Murex snail. And from this snail's shell, you were able to produce this dye, you, typically in the color of purple, various shades and such. And 
what made it so popular is because it wasn't necessarily easy to come by. It took hundreds, if not thousands of these tiny shells that had to be crushed up and boiled. It was a tedious, laborious process um, in order to produce enough dye to completely uh, dye uh, an article of clothing. So if you think about the color purple in history, it's typically associated with the regal and the royal and the rich and the wealthy. And that's because it was specifically produced, primarily I should say produced for the rich and the wealthy because it, while it was necessarily easy to, to find and collect the shells, it was just a process to get enough purple for everybody, the common person to be able to afford it. So, and fun fact from what I've read and from what I've heard from people who have done this process, um, it apparently smells just horrid. So I cannot imagine what that is like. Um, I'm sure if anybody has maybe smelled leftover seashells or something like that after they've been sitting too long, uh, maybe by the window or something, it's, it's not the most pleasant of scents. Um, but, uh, yeah, so there's that fun fact. So I'm sure that made it that much more enjoyable of a process to do, but, um, again, this Tyrian dye was probably the, the bread and butter, the staple to Carthage's trade and commerce and what really made them, what, what they were really known for in terms of the trade. In addition to this particular item, Carthage built a port that was just an amazing feat for its time. It wasn't the first port of its kind, it wouldn't be the last port of its kind, but it really was a status symbol for this city. Um, it was an amazing place that could hold hundreds of ships at a time. And we have records from a Greek, um, Greek historian named Appian, and he would come later down the road around 210 BC, uh, just discussing a lot of things that he saw throughout his time visiting other lands, traveling throughout again the Mediterranean. And I've pointed out some of the main areas and I'll, I'll um, discuss those in just a second, but I wanted to read some of the information that he left behind in his works. Now, this is all referring to the port at Carthage and he says, the harbors had communication with each other and a common entrance from the sea 20 meters wide, which could be closed with iron chains. So this yellow arrow up here towards the top where I've written harbor entrance, that's where the ships would all come in through. And as Appian mentioned, they apparently chained it up at night. This was most likely for security purposes, um, made it that much harder for any ships trying to escape and obviously any ships trying to get in. So this next area where I've labeled number one, the commercial harbor, the first port was for merchant vessels and here were collected all kinds of ships tackle. So this is where most of the, the merchant vessels would come in with their trade items, most of which they would unload, um, maybe send into town or go into town themselves and try and sell and trade them and bring items back with them that they would then take on to other ports throughout. Um, there were also little shops there where ships could get repaired. Uh, the men could the the men could buy tools and such in order to ensure that they had the necessary supplies as they continued on their journey or headed home from their journey. And it's estimated that about 350 merchant vessels could occupy this area at once, so at one time. So then he goes on, and we're going to be looking at this area that I've labeled number two, the military harbor, and he says, Within the second port was an island which, together with the port itself, was enclosed by high embankments. These embankments were full of, full of shipyards, which had capacity for 220 vessels. Above them were magazines for their tackle and furniture. So this is where a lot of the military vessels, most of, most of the Carthage uh, Navy would be situated. Now, naval vessels from other territories, regions, and countries 
were allowed in here, but it was really predominantly for Carthage's naval vessels here. And there was, you can maybe see here, one way in and one way out. So again, if there was a, a foreign vessel in here, it just makes it that much more difficult for them to get out in the event they were doing something illegal, something they shouldn't be doing, whether it's trying to steal, trying to take a ship, any number of things. So, and last but not least here, number three, Appian goes on to say, on the island was built the Admiral's house from which the trumpeter gave signals, the herald delivered orders, and the admiral himself overlooked everything. The island lay near the entrance to the harbor and rose to a considerable height so that the admiral could observe what was going on at sea, while those who were approaching by water could not get any clear view of what took place. Not even the incoming merchants could see the docks for a double wall enclosed to them, and there were gates by which merchant ships could pass from the first port to the city without traversing the dockyards. So just a, again, just an, a general overview of the port at Carthage. This was really the epicenter, again, for a lot of the trade that was happening throughout Carthage, throughout the city, and then further on as ships from other areas would also come here. Um, I have labeled here, number three, uh, the Kothan. And this was just the, the man-made, it was a man-made harbor. This was where the Admiral would have been situated, where he can overlook and see the daily activities that were going on, keep his eye out for anything that may be amiss or looks a little awry or offhand. Um, so basically this really great defense and protection of this port, it really was kind of like their baby. They really wanted it to be this thing that was as protected as possible because, again, this was really their reliance on where their money was coming in, where a lot of the population of people would kind of come in. It was, I guess, in a, some small way, it was maybe like the New York Harbor of its day. Uh, just it was the place to be for merchant vessels and even for naval vessels. Now, I mentioned before that Carthage wasn't necessarily this uh, civilization that was in it for the dominance and control and going out and conquering nations and regions, you know, just for the, the, the hay of it. Um, but they did have a really impressive Navy nonetheless, separate from their merchant vessels that were handling all of the trade and daily activity regarding that. And again, I'm still just setting the stage for some of the, the things that are going to be coming over the next couple of slides here. Now, just to kind of wrap up this section, um, the Port of Carthage really was, it set a precedence for ports throughout. Um, the shape of it was somewhat unique for its time, although it wasn't necessarily unheard of. It was very impressive in size. And again, I really think it just sets a precedence for a lot of other ports that would be seen as more nations and states would come out of the different areas of this region. Oops, sorry. So this is a modern view of the port of Carthage. It looks very different. And the previous image that I was using for reference was just an artist's rendering. So here is what remains at the port of Carthage off of the coast of Tunisia, North Africa. And I went ahead and you can go to Google Maps and you can Google the Punic port of Carthage as I have done in this left-hand image here. And again, just kind of showing what remains and comparing it to what historians, based on historical records and artists' interpretations, such as this image here on the right, giving you an idea of how it looked then to how it looked now. Time, unfortunately, has taken its toll. Everything from erosion of, of beachheads and 
the different cultures and civilizations that would come through the area changed the landscape a bit. But if you look, like I said, on the image on the left to the one on the right, you can see where a lot of that, um, where a lot of the look still remains and you can really get an idea of how the port of Carthage was situated. So as I've been going on and on about Carthage's Navy and the Roman Navy and the Romans themselves, I was trying my best to kind of lead up to this series of events referred to as the Punic Wars. Uh, Punic coming from the Latin term or word Punis, uh, which then over time became Punic. Um, so the Punic Wars were a series of three wars that took place between 264 BCE and about 146 BCE. And it was fought primarily between Rome and Carthage, the two, um, the two nations and empires that they were. Now, Rome at this time, I want to point out, was not an empire. It was still kind of like this foundling, fledgling, region and nation and such. And they really, throughout the series of these three wars, is going to become this force to be reckoned with. We're kind of going to look and see here. So looking first, I'm not going to go into detail too much on each Punic War. That could really be an entire program on its own. It could probably be three separate programs over over a series, but I just want to point out some of the highlights from it. So, of course, we being a maritime museum here, we do like to focus on a lot of maritime events. So throughout the first Punic War, one of the areas that was being contested was the small island of Sicily that I pointed out earlier. Now, the inhabitants there were technically under Carthage's reign. Um, and essentially the long and short of it was both Rome and Carthage wanted a piece of this land. Uh, they both went in and helped the people who were living there who were being uh, attacked by other tribes and such. Eventually it became contested between Rome and Carthage and they kind of started fighting not just over Sicily, there's more to it, I'm just kind of focusing on that specific area because an event is going to take place known as the Battle of Cape Economus. And I've kind of pointed out here, I've kind of blown up that map that we were looking at earlier showing the little island nation of Sicily and that the fighting was taking place around here. Now, Carthage had a pretty decent navy for its time. Rome, less so. Rome's army was still a really good force to be reckoned with, um, but they hadn't quite built or established a navy, especially in the way we think of the great Roman Empire that we will see down the road and everything. But um, as this battle is taking place, historians estimate that the Romans were able to build a fleet of roughly 330 vessels. And that's comparable to the Carthaginian fleet, which was around 350 vessels. So Rome was able to really start building up their naval prowess and, and uh, military force on the water. Now their strength was still to fight on land. So a lot of the battle of Economus did take place on land, but the fleets that were kind of attacking each other throughout this area around Sicily. Uh, it goes down, a lot of scholars agree that this battle is one of, if not the largest battles, naval battles in antiquity, not necessarily in history altogether, but in the ancient world. And on the left here, the left side image is a trireme vessel from our collection, one of my personal favorites. Um, trireme was typically used by Greek, Roman, and other ancient, uh, ancient civilizations. It had three levels to it with a bunch of oarmen, but the Romans took it up a notch because they included a ram at the front of their trireme. So what they would do 
is as they got closer to other ships, especially if, you know, during battle, one of their ships was already kind of on the downside and, and was beyond repair, you could then ram another ship, making a giant hole in it and at least taking another vessel down with you. An enemy vessel, of course. Uh, hopefully they weren't intentionally ramming their, their own ships, um, but I'm sure accidents do happen. So the First Punic War is essentially won by Rome and Carthage is forced to give up a lot of their territories uh, in various parts of this area. Uh, however, Rome's ultimate goal, they were kind of challenging Carthage's strength and they wanted the territory and areas that Carthage controlled. Again, primarily for dominance and control of the area, but Carthage was a major foothold in the trade routes, which always comes down to money. Um, so this is really the, the beginnings of what we see as Rome eventually leading into the Roman Republic and then the Roman Empire. So it's slowly starting from here. Um, and they were able to win the first Punic War. A treaty was signed. Everybody kind of went home, things calmed down for a bit, although tensions were constantly high and both, both areas, Rome and Carthage, were continually butting heads with each other. So naturally, that eventually leads us to the Second Punic War. And you may be a little bit more familiar with this one if you have heard of the name Hannibal. Um, not to be confused with Hannibal Lecter uh, from the movie, but Hannibal Barca was a military general of Carthage. Many historians revere him as one of the greatest generals of antiquity and especially of the African region. Um, so he was the, the leader for the army of Carthage during the Second Punic War. His father was a general during the First Punic War. And if you know anything about Hannibal, his claim to fame is that he took the fight to Rome and he did not do it in the easiest way possible. As you, let me back up to this map here. So you can kind of see the placement of Carthage to Rome. It's not that far, far enough, but by water, the Romans are gonna see the Carthage people, the Carthage military coming. So in order to catch them by surprise, Hannibal decided to take a different route. Um, and he decided to do it by going over a mountain range called the Alps. And he did so with uh, an army of, the numbers fluctuate and vary depending on which source you're reading from. Um, most sources say between 30 and 40,000 um, infantrymen. Uh, he had about 37 elephants and a handful thousand more. It was about 30,000 soldiers, 37 elephants, and 15,000 horses. Again, those numbers may vary. So around 218 BCE, Hannibal decides to lead his army through the Alps. And I've got these two images here because I think maps are really great for showing the landscape. The Alps are no slouch of a mountain range. The highest peak um, is about 15,000. Let me, let me get the, the right number here. Um, where is it? Sorry. So it stretches, the Alps stretch across about 745 miles, seven different modern day countries. And the highest mountain is about three miles high, Mont Blanc. So it says 4,800 meters, and that's on the Italian-French border. So it was, I, I love the image on the, the right because it really just that topographical depiction shows you it's this natural border that basically protects Italy. So the Romans weren't thinking anybody was going to be coming from this area. Hannibal made his attempt. So he left from, the bulk of his army left from Cartagena, which meant New Carthage, 
um, which is in present day Spain. Now he goes across the Alps at travel. He travels across. It takes him about 16 days. He loses a chunk of his army and his men, some of the elephants, the horses, because there are these tribes, these barbarian tribes from a, a land referred to as Gaul back in this time. And a lot of these tribes kind of lived within this area and there were some skirmishes along the way. But Hannibal does eventually manage to make it to Rome, catches the Romans by surprise, and fighting once again ensues. Now, the, the fight doesn't stop in Rome. Much of the, the um, fighting takes place down through the rest of the Italian region there. And eventually, once again, the Romans do win the Second Punic War. And just uh, to show, these are two images on the right-hand side, again, from our collection, because I do think we have a really great collection of the Swiss Alps. So they are a, a much older, older images from our collection, but I just thought it would be nice to include them here. So eventually, once again, treaties are signed, land is reclaimed by the Romans, uh, Hannibal eventually returns home, and there's a intermediate period there where, once again, there's still the tension, but the actual fighting has stopped until the Third Punic War. The Third Punic War is going to bring us to the end of Carthage's reign. Rome finally manages to make it to the port of Carthage. They manage to infiltrate in their way into the city and they basically do possibly what Romans did best. They took over and destroyed just about every brick and stone that made up the city of Carthage. The people who were not killed in the fighting were then enslaved and became a part of Rome's control. So the city was burnt to the ground, the port of Carthage was also destroyed, and at this time we're seeing kind of Rome at its height for this period. Again, this is just the beginning of them taking over much of the land surrounding the Mediterranean region, going in further to, to Africa, um, North Africa and Africa. So it was the rise, so to speak, of Rome's dominion and what will eventually become the Roman Empire as we're going to see it later on. Now, as the Roman Empire eventually falls, the area that was Carthage, the, the land that kind of made up the city that was Carthage, will come under control from a bunch of other groups, including uh, the Vandals, the Ottomans, um, and several others more over the centuries. But Carthage as its own entity kind of ends and stops here with the Third Punic War. So after maybe this uh, pandemic has ended and you feel like taking a trip to what I have to assume is a beautiful locale based on the images that I've seen, um, you can see the ruins of Carthage today. It is a protected site under UNESCO, um, and it became under UNESCO's care back in about 1979, if I remember correctly, and they are continuing to do archaeological work and preservation. There's a small museum there as well where you can see and uh, see a lot of the, the ruins and artifacts that they've uncovered and discovered in this area. And in, in, in addition to learning more about its history and the area that is or was uh, ancient Carthage. So um, there was one more thing I wanted to, to mention. But um, so I have included some in images here from UNESCO's uh, website, and I, I particularly love the image on the right, like the blue skies with the, the seascape in the background, just that crystal clear Mediterranean water mix. You've got the old ruins mixed with modern day with the modern day ship in the background. I think it is just a great kind of homage and a, a test a testament to how these ruins have stood the test of time. And 
the multiculturalism of different groups that would come in, destroy, rebuild, build on, and kind of continue this entity that was Carthage. Just a couple more uh, items from the archeological site. Most of these were most likely from Roman Carthage after Rome came in and it became an occupied territory of Rome and eventually the Roman Empire. Just a couple more. I particularly love this mosaic down here. Not entirely sure what it's supposed to be presenting. I can see that there's a horse and uh, a man in a tree, uh, but I'm sure that there's more to the story there if I had maybe all of the pieces from the images, but I still love, I love mosaics. Um, so just wanted to include that one as well. So again, if you wanted to visit Carthage, you can go to the capital city of Tunis in Tunisia today. And it's only about a nine to 10 mile drive. So it's not that far. And this is another Google Earth, Google map image that I took. And there's a main road here that'll take you straight there. Um, you can see way down here is that port of Carthage that I showed you. So a little off to the main city center of the Carthage region um, or the main city area that it was. And then this image or print on the right hand side, once again, from our collection, which denotes Tunis as a celebrated town. And again, all of the ships kind of just reiterating its maritime culture and the history that was built within this area. So uh, I, I really enjoy talking about ancient cultures. Um, I, I have a background in it and a strong passion for it. So sometimes when I speak on it, I wanna tell as much as I can um, in as much, in as little time as possible. But um, Carthage is one of those, not necessarily lesser known, but it really gets overshadowed by a lot of other great empires, um, specifically the Roman empire. And it kind of gets absorbed into their history but I wanted this presentation to kind of show it as its own entity. And that, as I've said throughout this entire presentation, how the city of Carthage, the port and the harbor of this region was really just setting a precedent for maritime culture in the Mediterranean region, almost unlike anything that had been done prior to. And based on a lot of the images and research that I've done, uh, familiarizing myself with modern day Tunisia and everything, the landscape is just beautiful from what I can see. And the people are these multicultural um, with this, uh, they're multicultural because they've had so many different types of peoples from Berbers, Jewish people, Islamic, Africans, um, people of Latin and Italian descent and their ancestry all have made up the culture of Tunisia and the, the present day city of Tunis. And these are just a couple of images that I found. I, I probably could have you know, done several slides of just showing Tunisia and Tunis, but I just wanted to incorporate some of the modern look of the area and again, the multiculturalism, the national pride that they have. And again, just some of those maritime remnants that still exist within their culture today. So with that, that ends my presentation on the first of our series of Africa's kingdoms and maritime cultures. Today, I spoke about the ancient city of Carthage. As Wisteria introduced, um, we will be continuing this next week and then throughout the year. So please uh, tune in February 23rd, that's next Thursday, I believe, at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And she will be talking a little bit on the Swahili coast and the cultures that came out of that area. And just continue looking out for more topics like this, not just throughout Black History Month, the month of February, but over the course of the year. And I've 
I think we left enough time for some questions, which I will be happy to answer to the best of my abilities. But I also wanted to include my contact information. My email is included here. My name, once again, is Erica Cosme. And there is my email address should anybody think of a question afterwards or want information or additional resources related to this topic or a topic of similar um, interest. I've also included the second uh, URL there is to our catalog and collection here at the Mariners Museum so that you can comb through and see what we have related to a plethora of maritime topics. Although as you've seen throughout this presentation, we do have several related specifically to, uh, to Carthage. We've got stuff related to the Romans, of course, we can't forget them, the Greeks, Egyptians, a ton of ancient cultures, modern stuff as well. Basically anything, almost anything maritime related that may interest you. And last but not least, I've included the link to our Black History Month programming and information so that you can see some more of the topics that we will be discussing as we kind of get into the last couple of weeks of February and thus wrapping up Black History Month. But again, some of these topics and series will be carrying further along into the year. So just be on the lookout for that. And with that, I will thank you all for your time today. I'm going to uh, stick around, answer any questions um, that we may have, and I will go ahead and hand it back over to you, Tim. Sure, so we have a couple of questions here. Um, first of all, uh, Wendy would like to know, is Carthage still a lively, thriving port city? So Carthage is not the lively, thriving port city as it was. As mentioned, it is an archaeological site, although it did thrive for several years while it was under control from the Romans, um, barbaric tribes, Islamic cultures that came in. They utilized a lot of that, uh, the natural resources Carthage, I, I don't think I mentioned, had like this, it was just a fertile area. Crops grew quickly. Um, and as I've said, with the port being there, it was just this major epicenter for people to come in and go. So it was really a coveted place for people to want and take over. Over time, it became a less prominent port. And as I kind of showed with some of the images, it's really just a we've got the ruins and but it's not necessarily the port city in the way that I just discussed over the past 45 minutes. Great. Um, we have another question here. Do you know the estimated population of Carthage at its height? And was that comparable to Tyre? Um, the estimated population, I believe was about 500 something I I had it and I unfortunately did not write it down in my notes here I thought I did um but eventually I would say if nothing else it was definitely comparable to Tyre and eventually became even slightly larger than Tyre after Alexander the Great took over that territory, kind of destroyed most of that region. And then over time he was kicked out and such. Tyre, Carthage, excuse me, essentially replaced Tyre as that uh, metropolis of the Phoenician people. So, and I apologize, I thought I wrote the number down. Um, and I don't remember it off the top of my head. So I will definitely have to look that up. I do apologize um, for not being able to answer that more specifically. All right, next question is, in the Third Punic War, you said the Romans infiltrated. Did I see a Trojan horse on the slide? Is that where the story <laughs> of the Tro Trojan horse came from? Um. So the story of the, the Trojan horse does still relate back to Homer's epic poem of the, the Iliad and, and similar poems that discuss the Trojan War. Um, let me go back. I don't even think I noticed. Um, so this, so it looks like actually that was most likely um, 
Uh, and of course the word is eluding me. Sie a siege uh, machine or a siege Yeah, weapon. exactly. It would have been used for siege. It would have been pushed most likely by the men it was on wheels or pulled. Um, and it would have been used to, as you can see here, um, fortify not just the men and carry supplies, um, but it would have been used as a weapon as well. Um, I, I honestly don't think I even noticed that despite the fact that it's at the, the center of the, the image there. But um, the Trojan horse uh, really does kind of portray, pertain more to the story of Troy itself. And now I'm curious, I don't think I've heard of that tactic really being used elsewhere. I'm not saying it, it wasn't. And of course the story of Troy and the Trojan war is shrouded in was it real and how much of it was real and how much of it was mythology so i'd be interested to see if there was any actual trojan horse or similar um thing used throughout history i know mark newcup did a presentation about a week ago where he talked about the polynesian people and they used something similar of a tactic except they used a shark so that was really interesting to make that correlation to. Great. Uh, so it looks like we have two more questions here. Sure. Um, one is, uh, so we look at the Punic Wars as the fall of North African kingdoms and is that the rise of the M Roman Empire? So it's not the official rise of the Roman Empire that would still come um, a couple centuries later, um, but it was really the rise of Rome as a military force. Um, again, its army was already kind of this impressive thing, but it just brought them to a new level. And then of course the incorporation of a Navy to their military strategy, again, just brought them into a whole new realm of um, as a military might in this area. The Roman empire would come uh, centuries later, when Octavian, I'm trying to remember my Roman history here because it's all right now Carthage in the forefront of my brain, um, but that came much later after Julius Caesar um, and when Augustus Caesar was officially crowned the emperor later on. Yeah, that was about what, like? first century AD, like- Yeah, uh, something like that. I- Early, I early first century. Used to have these dates much better in my head. I've been working here at the Maritime Museum for almost five years now. And a lot of my Roman history has been pushed out by maritime history, which is great because I love learning, but sometimes uh, the, the dates elude me more so than I, I care to admit. So I'm gonna have to go brush up on my Roman Empire because there was, you know, the Roman Republic that came first prior to the Roman Empire. So there are two separate entities. And then you have the Western Roman Empire versus the Eastern Roman Empire. The Western Roman Empire fell first. Um, then you get into the Eastern Roman Empire. And again, I can make a whole, uh, a whole presentation on that, which I just might have to do. Yep. Uh, we have we have someone in the comments here said it's uh it's about 31 bc yes because i think julius caesar was killed oh i wanted to say 46 but don't quote me on that i apologize sorry mm -hmm. i've got mostly carthage dates in my head if i start adding roman dates in there this program is going to get a little <laughs> a little wonky sure um, all right, so it looks like we got two two more questions here. Uh, this one here is, uh, uh, do you think the Punic Wars impacted, or how do you think the Punic Wars impacted uh, Rome in the long run? Are there aspects of Rome's early success that are a result of their relationship or conflict with Carthage? Um, yes, uh, so Rome's foothold in that region allowed them to take over a lot of that land that I mentioned was really fertile. They were also able to capture and enslave a lot of the people who were there who are already familiar with that land. So just, you know, a, 
for them. It was a feather in their cap, but then they were able to start expanding further across the Northern African lands, the landscape and all of that region. Um, and then from there, they were able to spread even further. So a lot of that foothold that Carthage had in the, or along the Iberian Peninsula as well, um, was able to come under Roman control, Roman empire. Rome was able to spread across uh, further into, like I said, Northern Africa and into Egypt. So all of these established lands were basically just now taken over by Rome. So that's not to say they didn't necessarily have to do any of the work, so to speak, but they basically just had all of these cities that they could already come in, take over and start controlling. Once you start controlling them, you can start taxing them, taxing the people. And essentially, you know, you've got all of that money to come and finance the Roman, uh, Rome as the capital uh, city. Um, the Roman armies, Rome from that point on, were able to grow their armies and then spread even further into Gaul, as I mentioned, um, the Germanic tribes of like present day Germany, the Franks in France, even up to Britannia, which is present day, the present day UK. So this really was kind of like, as I've said, the beginning of Rome's dominion and foothold throughout this entire Mediterranean region. And then even into kind of, um, uh, not East Asia, the, the Western, like, um, excuse me, uh, the, the Byzantine, what would become the Byzantine area, um, Asia Minor, that's the term I was trying to think of, my apologies, as I rattled my brain for that term. Um, so I think, and they also didn't have to worry about the rival that was Carthage anymore, uh, their maritime power, their maritime foothold, they didn't have to worry about dealing with them. So that's one less faction of people, especially a people as strong as, as that group that Rome had to contend with. So you start kind of dwindling down your enemy's control, you're able to build yours up more. So essentially, that's the long winded way of me saying, yes, I think it was uh, really the beginning for Rome being able to expand their territories. And as I've mentioned, those are just a couple of ways that, you know, how it was able to impact and kind of snowball and become greater. Rome was able to become greater and greater over time, but not too great because they did fall. Yep. Spread themselves too thin. Um, okay, so we have this last question here. Um, you had already, you had briefly mentioned the, the Berber people and the Amazigh people. Um, uh, so the question here is, can you speak a little bit more about the indigenous people um, in this territory uh, prior to the Phoenician occupation? Yeah, so essentially these were typically nomadic groups um, while they would settle for, you know, periods at a time. Um, as the seasons came, seasons went, they did kind of travel and traverse most of that landscape, although they did have settlements and such there. It was a mixture of people. I know a lot of the research that I read showed there were some, some small factions of sub, uh, sub-Saharan Africans who had moved up into that region, but most of the Berbers from that area came from uh, what was then referred to as like Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, present day Iraq, Iran, Yemen, um, and that area there. They had moved westward over time and kind of began establishing small cities, small settlements uh, along the North African coast. Again, that region just being so accessible for um, travel throughout the Mediterranean, which for the longest time was really the majority of what they knew about the world. They didn't know how big the world was at this time. So a lot of these cultures were situating themselves, a lot of these more Western cultures, I should say, were situating themselves along um, throughout the Mediterranean area. So they were utilizing a lot of the same resources of the land, trade and such, um, but most of the Berbers did come from 
like I said, some small sub-Saharan African groups, but predominantly that Arabian and into, as I mentioned, present day Lebanon and that area with some um, introduction of uh, Iberian peoples as well. So I, I think when the Phoenicians came in and really just grappled onto the harbor and turned it around and made it into this, as I've said, metropolis of sorts is really when um, more of a, a singular group of people kind of dominated the area. But over time, even post Carthage, post Rome, a plethora of cultures came in and kind of populated the, the region as well. Great, well, that looks like all the questions that we have today. Great, let me, I just realized. So just one last uh, thank you to everybody who joined us here today. I very much look forward to continuing this series. Um, please check out uh, the websites again, just for any other topics that may interest you or maybe uh, related to other Black history uh, information that we'll be covering. And with that, thank you all.